So just like that, we are officially live. Uh, Ahmed, I'm excited to dive in with you. You not only work and have worked at a number of really exciting companies, you've written a book in payments. Uh, why don't we start with that? Because not many people I talk to have written books in the payment industry. What was what was the, the moment where you realized, I have to write these ideas down? When did you realize you were sort of in a unique vantage point in the world that you had something worth saying? Yeah, uh, Mike, well, first of all, thank you for having me on the show. And um, yeah, I think um, uh, a lot of this happens by accident, I guess. Um, as a product manager, we do a lot of writing in general, um, a lot of stuff in Confluence and various wikis and, and that kind of thing. And I had an opportunity almost two years now ago to take part in a course to write a book. Um, and what was actually going on at the time was that, uh, when I joined branch about three years ago, um, the company actually wasn't really a payments or FinTech company. And so I was doing a lot of writing and having to explain a lot of things to our developers and also to the sales team, you know, the go to market team, et cetera. And so, um, we just you know, I kept repeating the same thing over and over again. And when I got the opportunity to put it into book form, I took it and essentially translated a lot of those confluence pages into um, something that people can read. My first draft of it was horribly, horribly dry. And I had this amazing editor that, uh, you know, she was like, well, we need to kind of turn this into a story. And, uh, you know, we, we storified it and um, it came out as actually pretty decent read read for a book uh that's on a very very like technical level um i yeah. think i think just generally speaking payments there's not a ton of people out there that really understand it well uh, and that's simply because it's very very complicated and um i wanted to build something that was really easy for anybody to pick up and read and so like one of my my main pushes was I wanted to have a lot of pictures. I wanted to have a lot of drawings. We ended up like actually putting in comics into the the actual book to help explain some of these concepts. And um, I'm just I'm just a visual learner, and so I wanted to make sure that I was able to put something that even I can understand in there. Yeah, and w where did you learn the most, or, or where did you learn? things that other people wouldn't have learned. I know you worked as VP of product at, at Marketa um, and some other roles, but I, I'm curious, what, what role were you doing at what company where you really got to learn a lot? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think every job that I've had, I want to make sure that the number one priority is to learn, right? Um, but I, you know, when I was in San Francisco, I, I had a bunch of different roles. Um, I started off my career as a, a data architect at IBM. And so I did a lot of work, um, you know, building out really great data architectures and that kind of thing. And for, for very, very large companies. And I got to a point where I was just kind of tired of the corporate life and I wanted to get into startups. So I moved from Minneapolis to San Francisco um, to kind of like look for that opportunity. Uh, I did my own startup, you know, unfortunately did not go anywhere. Um, and I went into venture capital for a little bit. And then finally I got this uh, call from a high school friend of mine, um, Dave Matter. And he uh, was like, hey man, I'm also in the Bay Area. I know that you're in the Bay Area. We probably should get together for coffee. So just kind of like got together with him. And he was the head of product over at Marketa which when I first met with him, I was like, I don't know what your company does. Like, is it something like Stripe? Um, and he was kind of explaining the product to me and what, what it does. And I was like, this is pretty cool. Um, and well, how, what did he explain or tell me? Well, so yeah. So what is and the way that he explained it and remember, I don't know if most of your listeners know this, but uh, the early days of Marketa um, was actually very, very different. I mean, I joined Marketa as employee 35 uh, really early on, and the company was kind of founded on this idea of, could I put multiple Groupons onto one card that can be swiped at the location? And so when Dave and I met up for coffee, he uh, took me to Farley's in Oakland, and um he, he said, hey, look, you know, I preloaded uh, $30 onto this card for Farley's. Uh, when I swipe this card at Farley's, it's going to actually um, 
debit from the Farley's balance, but I also have a balance at like Home Depot, for example, um, and it won't draw down from that. Uh, and so when he showed me that, I was like, oh, that's kind of cool because now you can actually put all these different like balances essentially on one card and it only draws from the one that it should be drawing from, right? And so I thought that was really interesting. And I was like, okay, well, I still couldn't draw the distinction because everything in the news at the time was like, okay, everybody knew what Stripe was, right? Um, and he was just like, well, look, you know, Stripe is on one side where it's helping accept payments uh, for people that have websites and whatnot. We're actually on the other side where we actually create the payment. Um, where it's, it, it, you know, we have a set of APIs, et cetera, that allow you to create a card that you can use to spend. And one of the major, you know, early features was the fact that you can have multiple balances essentially on one card. And so that's kind of where my journey started in payments. Like, again, mm. com came in completely <laughs> blind. Um, and what was interesting was um, he caught me at a very interesting time in my life where my wife and I, we had our first kid and we were actually planning on moving to Minnesota, uh, which is where I'm originally from. And uh, he, you know, caught me literally a week before the moving truck was coming. And so I was like, I was just like, hey, I want to catch up with a high school friend, like whatever. And uh, he's like, he's like, no, 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 no. You can't go to Minnesota. Like, uh, would you consider working? Um with me at Marquetta. And I was kind of like, well, you know, we kind of made up our mind. We, we want to get closer to my parents so that, you know, uh, my daughter can be closer to them, et cetera, and grow up with her cousins and whatnot. Um, but then he's like, Hey, look, there, there is this opportunity that we have out in Dubai, uh, where we're trying to launch a card program for a very big mall, um, out there. And I was like, Hmm, that's kind of interesting. That's like on my bucket list of things to do. Like I've always wanted to work in, you know, a Middle Eastern country. And he kind of looks at me and he's like, are you sure? <laughs> like, are you sure you want to go to Minnesota? Like, I mean, we could make this work. And so I was like, okay, let me talk to my wife. And, you know, that night I was like, okay, do you, um, are you, are you open to, I was basically like, okay, do you want the snow or the sand? And, <laughs> and she's like, what are you talking about? And she's like, well, look, there's this opportunity for us to like move to Dubai. And she's like, uh, okay, well, you don't really get too many opportunities like that. And luckily I've got a very, very understanding wife. And so we're just like, yeah, let's do it. And that's, that's how I got wow. into payments. And so you moved not from San Francisco to Minnesota, but from SF to Dubai. To Dubai, yeah. Very soon. So we after. had we had like a month, I think, left in uh, in San Francisco, and then uh, moved to Dubai. <laughs> wow! And how long were you there? Uh, so we were supposed to be there for two years, but the engagement got cut short, and so we were only there for six months. Um, okay. And that it, it it was a forcing function to really learn uh, not only payments how it works in the U S but actually how it works in the middle East of all things, you know, and, you know, since there really wasn't a lot of content out there or even people that really knew uh, how this stuff works, it, we were just kind of forced to like learn it. Um, you know, it's like we had, we were working on the discover network initially, then, you know, we went to MasterCard, then we went to visa and like the, the challenge is that, you know, the networks, they have so many people um, all across the organization that it is, there isn't one person that like really is able to understand, you know, explain this stuff. And so mm -hmm. a lot of what, you know, sort of the early Marketans, Marketans did um, was we, we had to like learn this stuff from scratch. Um, and we built our own processes and built our own relationships, et cetera. And um, that's actually how we learned uh, about payments. And we did a ton of documentation, like a ton of confluence pages about like how this works, how that works. I mean, just like how, how does, how does a transaction even flow from the card terminal all the way to your bank? Uh, and take, yeah, money tell in? me like, how would it be different than here? So here it would go, you would take your credit card out, you'd swipe it at a terminal at a store and based on 
the bank that you have, it, you, the the how, well, you describe it. You, you're way better at articulating this. But, yeah. yeah, I mean, like it's a, so what's what's cool about it is that it actually isn't very different in in Dubai uh-huh. uh, or even the rest of the world. I mean, card based transactions for the most part work very similarly. The only key distinction is that they're really big on chip and pin. And so uh, mm-hmm. in most places, when you insert that card in, it always asks for a pin. Whereas in the US, we, we do mostly chip and signature. And nowadays, like the signature doesn't, e- it, it doesn't even exist anymore. So because, and that's just because the networks have decided that the EMV chip is secure enough. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, let's, let's kind of rewind. Like one of the, the items that I talk about, at least in the book is, um, you know, how, what happens during that swipe? And that's why it's called the anatomy of the swipe is because I'm actually like dissecting what actually happens during the swipe. And again, it, I call it swipe, but it's more like inserting your, your card or tapping it or right, whatever. It's right, the same right. thing. It's the same thing. Right. Um, and so let's just take, for example, I, I absolutely love mochas from blue bottle coffee. Um, I'm going to go there. I've got a card, uh, from, uh, my Wells Fargo, um, and I go ahead and, uh, order a mocha there for 475. Um, uh, they say, okay, you can go ahead and pay at the, at the terminal. I go ahead and take out my card and I insert it into the card reader. And what's happening right now is that the, the card reader, um, at the merchant is actually communicating with, uh, what's referred to as an acquirer processor. And the acquire processor has an acquiring bank with it. And it takes information such as the dollar amount. It takes the card number. It takes more information about whatever that transaction is. And it passes that over to Visa or MasterCard, whichever the network Wait, is, right? Can I ask you a question? Yeah. So when it, that when that happens, does that use the Wi-Fi and the internet? Uh, it, it won't use a website, right? It has its own protocol yes. that it will use, but it uses the internet just like any other website or, you know, transact any other information exchange would on the internet. That's right. I mean, before it used to be the case that you use a dial-up connection, uh, right? But now, you know, everything is Wi-Fi connected, and so some you know older terminals are still Ethernet connected, but now you've got the newer terminals from Square and Toast that you know you can actually walk around with it. Um, but um, and, and, uh, are they using their own is there like a an issuing bank or or VAT, visa mastercard protocol like i'm thinking with the you know https or tcpip email is there that this is kind of the entrenched network of payments uh yeah. What is that? What is that about? Or how does that? Yeah, sort of I'm, I'm glad you asked. So there is a protocol called ISO 8583. Um, and that is the protocol that all sort of card based transactions work. Um, so Visa, MasterCard, Discover Amex have kind of agreed on this format. And that's how it works. It's a very compact message. And it uh, is designed for speed, right? Um, and so in that, uh, so when that card terminal is communicating to the acquirer, the acquirer then basically takes all that information and creates that ISO 8583 message. Uh, in, and in that you've got like the card pan, the request amount, the merchant name, et cetera. And it sends all of that over to MasterCard or Visa. Um, and, uh, MasterCard then takes a look at it. It determines that, um, this card is issued by Wells Fargo. Um, or whichever bank it is, and it will go ahead and send that message over to Wells Fargo's acquirer processor, um, or issuer processor, sorry, I always get these, yeah. So it sends it to the issuer processor, issuer processor then goes ahead and determines, number one, does Ahmed have enough money in his account to be able to cover it? Uh, Are there any fraud flags that come up? Um, And is he allowed to spend at Blue Bottle, right? Um, and so, so this would be like your Wells Fargo, uh, is in this case, the issuer processor. So Wells Fargo gets an inbound, like a request. Uh, so Wells Fargo is the issuing bank. I don't know who their processor is. Right. So mm-hmm. my, my gut tells me it's, it's more like Fiserv or FIS or TSIS, one of, one of those, um, you know, Marketo would be in that realm, but I know that Marketo doesn't. Uh, process for mm-hmm. Wells Fargo. Um, it, it, I mean, if we were to talk about Cash App, then yes, right. So that would be that would be the the situation. If you've got a Cash App card, uh, then that message would go to Marketa. Then Marketa would basically make a decision: um, is it good? 
then they'd send it back to the network. The network then sends it to the acquirer. The acquirer then sends it back to the terminal. And then finally you get that approval message um, that happens. And so this is all happening within a span of less than three seconds. So it's, it's a lot of jumps that are happening and then um, there's a decision being made. Uh, and so a vast majority of the time, you know, like most issuers are not able to uh, process faster than that just because of the way that they're architected. Um, you know, when we were at Marketo, we, we were able to do it in like a third of the time. We we're like, what do we do with these two seconds? And so we can, we can talk a little bit more about that um, later to, today, but it's, it's, it's kind of interesting um, how that transaction works. And then the money, the actual, so what's going to happen is on your account, you're going to see a minus $4.75 uh, right away on your statement as a pending charge. And then typically it clears the following day. And that's when the money, the real money actually moves. Mm. So what is that? So that's the pending represents when your Wells Fargo in this case is notified by the TSIS or Pfizer. Hey, there's a charge that you should expect that Ahmed made at, at Blue Bottle just a heads up. So it's just going to say pending. And then the, is there some, something that happens at the end of the day that they need to wait that long to make the official uh, charge come through? Are they like aggregating it or somehow manually reviewing or why is there that delay? The, the delay is actually, I mean, it, it, that's just, I guess is the process. But um, one of the things that could happen is I could add a dollar tip. Ah, um, uh, I see. I and see. So, and that usually happens post. Um, right. And by the way, there's there's some interesting newer companies that are doing it at time of swipe nowadays, uh, which is kind of changing that dynamic. But regardless, for right now, um, most places the actual transaction comes in. That's how much the 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 hold is going to be for. And then if I add a dollar tip to it that'll be part of the clearing and settlement process. And so at the end of every night, the merchant basically runs a batch job and then goes ahead and submits that to the network. Now, what could happen is, you know, sometimes if there was a missed swipe or, or somebody was like, oh, I actually don't want that item, uh, it gives the merchant the opportunity to cancel it. Um, and so when they cancel it, ultimately the money goes back to the cardholder, but then, um, and they're not charged for the settlement. Hmm. Got it. Got it. On, on Visa MasterCard, I'm always fascinated by them because they, they are so massive. Uh, their role is, is what exactly? Because if I have the card and I have the uh, Wells Fargo account, and then there's the, the Fiserv that's acting on behalf of Wells Fargo to manage those inbound payment requests. And then there's my, and then there's the merchant bank. Why do we need Visa MasterCard? So I, I think the beauty of how the Visa MasterCard network has been set up is that it's both of those are what's referred to as open networks, right? Um, and, you know, Discover and Amex are what's referred to as closed, closed networks. And the reason why it's cool with the open networks is that the, uh, the merchant can have any sort of relationship with any acquirer. Um, it doesn't need to be the same as the issuer, right? Uh, and same thing on, on the issuing bank side, they can have uh, multiple processors um, as well on their side. Um, and then it all just kind of like gets hooked together through Visa or MasterCard. So they essentially mm -hmm. are kind of the, the middleman connecting all these things together. Uh, and that's, that's why it all works. The reason, and one of the major reasons why Visa and MasterCard are so big is because they give that kind of flexibility for people to go out and, you know, essentially put in any terminal that you want uh, to accept payments or any gateway or whatever. Uh, and as an issuing bank, you can you can issue any type of card um, through any type of processor. Uh, and that's, that's yeah. why they've been able to grow so fast. And, and do you see, I guess, in the parallel world of crypto, the layer one protocols out there, uh, Ethereum and Solana and Cardano and all these these layer one protocols. Are, is that the analogous competition in the decentralized world to Visa MasterCard? Is that a fair comparison? It's, it's a fair comparison because they they are what's what's managing the data in between, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Even though they are technically decentralized, um, there still is some authority that's managing the flow of data, right? 
Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, that's what's going on. And again, if you look at even Ethereum, um, the, the gas fee, you know, it's, it's a charge to move money. Like if I was, if I, if I needed to send you one ether, like I'm paying something to send it to you, it's not free. Um, and similarly, the, the card networks have, uh, come up with a set of, it's a set of fees, um, that are basically charged to the merchant, um, that kind of pay for all of this. And mm-hmm. I think, I think what's, what's really interesting here is that it's not just one party, um, that is receiving this money. And I, I think that's a common misconception. They're like, oh my God, like Visa charges these merchants so much money, um, to, to, collect payment. And the reality is that a very, very small fraction of that actually goes to Visa or MasterCard. Like there's all these players that you now have to pay because again, in, in the example I just gave, there's the, the terminal provider, there's the acquirer processor, there's the acquiring bank, there's the issuer processor and there's the acquiring bank. And if there's a program manager, you got to pay that. So like, there's a lot of people here that, you know, essentially are doing a lot of work that need to get paid for that given transaction. And what Visa and MasterCard have done is they've created a system that, you know, kind of equitably pays each party out. Um, but they are in the middle. So they always get, you know, they get a toll from here and a toll from there. So, mm, um, Yeah. What, what part of it surprised you the most, either when you were in Dubai or working at Marketa? Uh, wh- where were you like, wow, that's fascinating. Was there moments that you just recall being uh, stunned about how the, the system works on the inside? I think, I mean, it, it is remarkable how old the technology is and yet how mm. fast it is. Like, I mean, that three second... I mean, and how many transactions run through those rails? It's incredible. Like, I mean, yes, the 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 latest you know info about Solana. I think Solana has has a real shot at getting to that sort of Visa uh, level. Um, and there are other blockchains that are getting really really fast. Um, but it's it's amazing that the technology is that old and it's so fast. Um, yeah. I think the the other key piece of this that one of the other inspirations for at least for me to write the book is I actually would like for more people to understand this a little bit better Um, simply because, you know, not very many people understand it. And therefore, you know, the level of innovation that has happened, you know, on core payments, there's not a ton of it. There hasn't been. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like now it's really kind of ramped up, but I think the more people that can understand this, I think overall collectively, you know, the system is going to get better. Yeah, totally agree. I, I remember my first, actually, the reason I started this podcast in 2013 was my first startup was called Zing Checkout. And we were building a square competitor. It was like a iPad based uh, point of sale system. So you could use your, uh, you know, iPad to run checkouts at uh, fairs and retail shops for multi-location stores, particularly for clothing stores. <clears throat> and throughout that experience, I remember feeling how incredibly uh, difficult it was to figure this stuff out. And we would go, I, I went to twice, I went to the, um, is it called ETS, Electronic Transaction, ETC, ET, ET, is that the right? Uh, it's in Vegas. I'm, I haven't been in so long, but it's the big, is that, have you been there? Is that ringing a bell? ETS? Oh yeah. There's a big conference where Fiserv and, um, uh, God, uh, if you said the names, I'd remember them, but the, all the large merchant acquirers go and they do deals together. You know, they're, they're partnering with the banks, the Visa MasterCard are there. It's like, you would love it. This would be, you know, you'd be, you'd I mean, be are you, are you, fascinated. are you thinking of money 2020? I don't know if the- no, no money 2020 is separate money. 2020 is like the consumer facing, uh, money conference. This is like, uh, you, you should check it out. You, you'd find it fascinating. It's like behind, it's like the engine room for <laughs> money. 2020 ETS is like, you know, all these back end payment companies go to this. Uh, it's a pretty big deal in that world. And I remember feeling like, how is this company so big? And I've never heard of them and I still can't figure out what they do. And they're running, you know, acquiring payment processing services for some banks. And there's just so many banks. There's so many providers out there. It's like you can have a couple billion dollar companies and have never heard of them and still be working in the space. Yeah. And then there's also a ton of, at the time, this may have consolidated, but there's a ton of uh, ISOs, independent sales organizations that sell the merchant account processing on behalf of 
you know, different providers. It's kind of, it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a Tupperware model, you know, where it's yeah. like you have the original product and then people sell that product and people sell, you know, the product for that person and uh, so on and so forth until you get salespeople walking in the doors to merchant, you know, to merchant retailers to sell them on cheaper rates. Cause it's always about competition on rates. So yeah, I found that world fascinating. Um, yeah. So I have to, I definitely need to write that one down and see what that's about. Yeah. Yeah. Since we were on it, I don't want to move off uh, too quickly, but uh, Mer uh, Merketa, what did they do that was innovative? You mentioned the fact that they could have different balances on one card. To me, that sounds kind of cool, but I, I can't see that being, maybe I'm, I'm not appreciating it, but it doesn't seem to me like the massive idea was yeah. there. Did that lead to something else or wh what's the, what did they do that was so special yeah so so when jason gardner uh marketa ceo was looking to build the solution essentially for himself um he um asked all the other issuer processors if this is possible and they all came back and they said nope we can't do this um or even if we could do this it's going to be if like a million dollars and you know, maybe we might be able to do it for you. Depends on the roadmap. Probably won't happen for another year or two, right? Um, and like, that's kind of where the spark was for him to like explore this because his previous startup was also in payments, but um, uh, it was on the other side. It was on the acquiring side. Uh, he didn't know anything about the issuing side, and so then he was like, you know. Um, I really want to build this. And if I need to do this, then I will need to build issuing and processing from scratch. And so the, the early team um, at Marketa, like they all, you know, the way that they built things was on, in the cloud. And so, you know, be a consumer apps or whatever, like they built everything in the cloud and they're like, okay, well, if we're going to do this, we're going to build this thing in the cloud. And one of the things that came out of it was just that it was it was a technology platform that was actually built by people that didn't have a ton of industry experience um, and was built in a very modern way in the cloud, right? Um, whereas the other sort of incumbent issuer processors were all kind of mainframe based, um, and so we we built the we built the product um, in the cloud first, and then you know. Um, launched the product it was it was good like again it requires a lot of sales effort to go to all these merchants and you know get deals through them etc i mean you, you can imagine how big the sales team is at groupon to do this and so um as we were kind of doing that um we started getting interest from um, other companies that were looking to actually white label this product um, so, uh, some of the early, you know, customers were Facebook and eBay and with Facebook, they wanted to do a, um, a friend card or a, actually, I don't even remember what we called it, but, uh, the idea was, um, if it's your birthday, I can go ahead and send you a hundred dollars at target and your mom can send you, you know, a hundred dollars over at home Depot. And then it shows up on one card. And then you can go ahead and spend it. And then you've got a Home Depot balance and a Target balance, right? Um, mm. So that that was kind of the first foray into taking what we had built and uh, turning it into a platform. And so we ended up having to build APIs uh, because, again, the way in which Facebook you know wants to develop is they want to develop in a modern way. So we basically took our platform and put APIs on it, opened it up to them. And then they went ahead and launched the product. It was really big success uh, early on. And uh, then we were like, well, you know what? There's probably a lot of interest in the platform uh, rather than our own, you know, uh, Groupon card. And so we did, we did the, uh, the Marketa card for a little bit longer, but then we realized that there's more opportunity in actually helping other people, other, tech companies essentially, uh, build their own card programs. Uh, and that's, that's what was really, really unique in uh, what we built. And again, we built it from scratch. Um, and we, ha we have a direct connection to the card networks. Um, and so there is no other middleman in between. And so like we were talking about earlier, our transaction processing was incredibly fast. And, you know, as transaction volumes went up, we were able to scale because everything was built in the cloud. So um, you've got like 
you know, sub second response times for that entire loop happening. And it allowed um, the birth of what's referred to as just in time funding um, that really, really opens up the doors for any company to be in that authorization loop. And so, mm. you know, historically, you know, with any other issue or processor, the, you, it's pretty limited in what you can do. Like the example that I showed uh, to you with the coffee, it was just like, okay, um, you know, I can check the balance that's on the ledger. I can, you know, see if that MCC or that merchant is allowed, if there's some basic fraud flags or whatever, but that's pretty much the extent of it. But, you know, if you look at um, uh, the, the more modern tech companies, you look at DoorDash or Instacart or these guys, you know, where they actually have a lot of really rich data about that given transaction, including things like geolocation, uh, you know, is this person on the clock or off the clock? Um, now they can, we can go ahead and send that message over to them and they can decide uh, if this uh, should be approved or not based off of whatever logic they want to build. Um, and so since we had that extra, whatever, whatever you want to call it, two seconds or whatever, we, we went ahead and sent it to them who are also built in the cloud and then uh, they would respond back and then we would respond back through the network. And that's actually what's really, really special about the platform is because because it's built in the cloud, it's able to um, do these sort of things that are very like, and works really great with modern platforms such as, you know, your, the squares of the world and, you know, DoorDash, Affirm, et cetera. So, so I take it other companies aren't in the cloud? Other uh, processors are not in the cloud? So when you run the card at a terminal, it's going to some server in the thesis or it's going to their location and wherever they are. I think things have changed now, but, uh, um, okay. you know, back then, you know, everything was, got it. that was, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Got it. And how many other, um, new companies would you say have, have built processing from the ground up? Like how unique is this Has square stripe? Um, um you know, are they, are they, is it that hard? Is it like, is it super hard or is it, Super unique. So, so Square opted to partner, and so mm -hmm. for on the issuing side, um, you know, I mean, I think the the beauty of Square actually is the fact that they build these amazing experiences on top of all of this. Like issuing processing at at its core, it it is a lot of work, but you know, at the same time, it's sending signal from point A to point B, essentially, right? Um, and, and I think Square is really smart about that, where they want to really own that customer experience and be able to create awesome products around it. So, you know, they partner with Marketa to do this. Um, Stripe actually has built their own issuing as well. Um, mm -hmm. and it's more recent, I mean, within the last, I would say, four or five years, I guess. Um, and they decided to build their own, uh, again, much like Marketa. Um, there are a few other ones that, um, you know, are pretty interesting. I think Lithic is super interesting. Um, similar thing. They, they built it from the ground up. They were, they used to be called privacy, privacy.com. Uh, and, and the other one is uh, high note, which is new. Uh, I don't know too much about them, but I've been hearing a lot of interesting things about them. So, um, th there are, there are people that have built, you know, issuing from the ground up. And then previous to Marketa earlier was really Galileo. Um, that took the charge to build it. And then everybody else is just like, you know, two decades back. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. It's such a, it's such a it almost reminds me of like space travel where you had this big explosion you know, a long time ago and then there's been nothing since. And then there's kind of this renaissance of people who are diving in and rethinking it using modern technology. It's uh, yeah. Interesting trends. <clears throat> it's interesting um, trends. And I think it's, it's interesting that, um, you know, a lot of us did not have any payments experience when we when we first started. You know, at least the early team, and and we we built things in the way that we wanted it to be built. Mm -hmm. Were there any massive learnings, or not regrets, but you're like, oh man, I wish we had somebody on board who knew this because you end up going. Sometimes you go down dead end roads, yeah. and you're like, oh, I have this great idea, and you spend six months on it and realize, oh, we can't do that because of the ways. It, sometimes it's regulation. Sometimes it's technical limitations or just structural limitations to a network? I, I mean, I, yes. I mean, I think that there's, there's two sides of this that yes, we did make a ton of mistakes, right? Like I, without a doubt, but I mean, that's the beauty of working in a startup is like, 
Yeah, yeah. You can. You can. And making mistakes is good and okay. And actually, people appreciate that you are actually trying something and making mistakes, but trying. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, um, totally. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the one thing that we did really well is we we made some amazing partnerships with people over at the card networks. Um, so Visa and MasterCard, Discover, they've all been like amazing you know, partners to work with. Granted, it did take us a really long time to find the right people uh, to work with, but uh, I think we were able to build some really great, repu- uh, you know, a re- good reputation, but also good relationships there. Um, the the one thing I found interesting is um, we, you know, when, when you're small, people don't really pay attention to you. Um, but then as soon as you start getting a little bit of success, that's where... I think kind of ears perk up and people want to work with you. And I think in, in payments in general, I think there is a lot of conversation around, Oh, there's a lot of regulation and it's this or that or the other thing, but you always need somebody to ask the question why. And um, I think one of the advantages that we had not having that much experience in payments was we weren't afraid to ask why, because Otherwise, if we, if we had the knowledge, we'd just be like, oh, well, maybe let's not ask. Right. Why. Like, that's just how it is. And let's shut up and not do anything. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost like if you if you've been down that road and you know how painful it is and how fr- how frustrating the experiences are, you're like, I don't want to I don't I don't instead of saying it's impossible, which is what you you're tempted to say, you're like, uh, it's just too hard. And, you know, you don't see it's all about this, this matrix that we're living in of life is just about seeing pathways to convince people that this is what you're offering is valuable. And you, you can you can construct software in a way you can align ones and zeros on a circuit board and and that creates value. But it's really like the highest level vision is where it comes from. It's like it has to be it has to provide a pathway to people feeling like this is more valuable than the, than the incumbents in the space. And that, that, that separation between what you're building and what exists already, the, uh, you know, innovation gap is, is a function of what, where, how far you can see, how how far and how, um, how well you can pave that road. You know, it's like if you're trying to go through a forest, yeah, it might seem overwhelming and scary. There's animals and you can get lost and die and starve, but you can also like blaze the trail and then lay down a road. And then, you know, you can, people can, you can invite people out there and you can throw a big party. So, you know, by analogy, it's like, I'm kind of on your side with this is I feel frustrated oftentimes with regulation because you see the regulation and it's giant stop signs. Can't do that. Can't do this. Can't do that. Pay this, pay this tax, pay this toll. And it it kind of closes your mind down to seeing what, what is possible. So I, I very much on the side being an entrepreneur of like, let's just fuck all that. Let's just imagine what is possible and then figure out a way through all those stop signs because the stop signs can change. You know, you can, you can, you know, <laughs> go to regulators and say, Hey, this is, I don't, I don't think this is fair. Or you can figure out some clever way around it. Like people can solve anything, man. That's yeah. one thing I'm convinced yeah. of. I mean, I, I think it, it's more about the execution. It's just like, you can solve it. You can move things. Um, I, I don't know if you've ever read, uh, Jim McAlvey's book, um, about the early days of square. Um, Oh, I, part of it. I started it, but go on. It's super interesting how they talked about how they needed to get certain things done and the, the networks just wouldn't allow it. And then they eventually were able to, you know, get, get around it. Um, and it was just, again, same, very similar story. It was just like, they didn't have any experience, you know, um, in the field and they just kept asking why, um, and they found a way, uh, you know, being Mm. able to, uh, communicate a card number through the um, what are the phone jack, uh, the the headphone jack. We don't even have those anymore, but like mm-hmm. uh, through the headphone jack on a phone, like that's crazy, you know. Mm. Um, mm. So yeah, I mean, I, I I think if you if you have an idea, um, I think it's worth pursuing, and you have to execute because uh, there are plenty yeah. of people out there with a bunch of ideas that don't do anything. 
Um, but it's always the people that try, maybe you fail, um, but at least you learn something, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think of it like riding a wave, you know, like look at Square, the headphone jack. It's a, it's amazing technology. You can plug a, square, a credit card reader into a, into your iPhone and then swipe it at a farmer's market. That's great. That was their hook. But then you no longer have headphone jacks and people are not even using the credit cards anymore. So what are you going to be then? And I think they did a great job in just moving forward. There were so many people in the payments industry that were like – you know, naysayers like, oh, Square is going to die. They're not, you know, they, yeah. they, they, they made this bad move and they're done. It's just, you, you know, you persist on. Speaking of this, are there sectors or companies in particular within payments that you feel uh, don't get enough appreciation? Certainly, uh, to throw out a few, there's a massive trend. Maybe, maybe I should ask if, if nothing stands out there, I also want to ask you on trends. Um, Certainly, I feel like the, a major one is the banking sector, which used to be largely uh, physical locations inside of cities with expensive zip codes to now being in the cloud, these neobanks. And there's some limitations. You know, There's a lot of massive funding rounds that are going into these companies, Mercury and Novo, and you know, there's other ones, I'm sure. But uh, yeah, what comes to mind for you? Yeah, I think, uh, well, number one, there are a bunch of really – cool um, regional banks that are serving mm. as sponsor banks uh, for all of these neo banks that don't get a lot of credit. Um, so, I mean, you think about like Sutton Bank or Evolve Bank and Trust or, you know, Meta, et cetera. Like there's so many of Lincoln Savings. Um, so they're all banks that are actually powering a lot of these neo banks. Um, and so I think they don't, get it enough credit because they're trying to innovate as well. They, they want more deposits on their platform and they're basically saying, Hey, you know what? We'll, we'll work with you, um, to actually help bring these deposits on. Right. Um, so I think that that's really cool. I think, um, you know, obviously, uh, you know, if we're talking about the Neo banks, I, I, I definitely think that chime gets a lot of, a lot of news and I've, I've got a ton of admiration for chime and what they're building. I think it's, it's an awesome mission and, um, their product is awesome. Uh, current is also doing great Varo, et cetera. Um, but then you've got a ton of sort of more niche, uh, neo banks out there, right? Uh, daylight, uh, is one. And, you know, even with uh, where I'm at right now with branch, um, you know, we, we essentially are a worker payments platform. Um, uh, but our core demographic for the end user is actually the American worker, um, be it, you know, a, a regular hourly worker or be it a gig platform worker, et cetera. Um, we're actually building services very, very specifically to them. Um, and, you know, in terms of like core payments and stuff, there definitely are other innovations. But again, the, our laser focus is on this demographic. And I think that's that's important to look at is like, who are the companies out there that are actually like really pretty like customer obsessed um, that are doing very interesting things? Um, yeah. Let's talk about Branch a little more. Is your... Uh, so... I'm just putting this together now. I'm just realizing this. CEO's name has your same name. What's the relation? <laughs> oh, we're brothers. No, no, no. There's no relation actually. Which is that really? No. Yeah. So if you take a look, um, so a, a, a Tiff, uh, his last name is also Siddiqui. It's one letter off. So. Oh, is it? Oh, yeah. Oh, 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 I, yeah. I, I, you have uh, a U in there. Okay, gotcha. You, he does. That's so funny. Huh. Um, it very, very man to be very honest like i number one i have never been in the same company with another siddiqui um let alone being my boss so <laughs> yeah it, it's uh it's very it's very strange but he is an absolute amazing guy i consider him as my brother so uh even though we are not officially related you're only one letter away does I'm the name mean it away. that's right yeah is there a translation, a literal translation that you know? Uh, so, so Siddiqui actually means your friend. So, hmm. so yeah, so, so we are, we are your friend. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> and, uh, he, he started the company. Did, is he the one you met or how, you know, I, I think of your time is what company you, you, you could obviously work for a lot of companies. Um, 
what was the hook that got you in with Branch? Uh, was it the commonality with the last name or? <laughs> <laughs> no, Tiff is probably the best salesperson I know. So he, uh, he uh, definitely convinced me uh, uh, pretty well. But there's there's the the backstory on this one is that um, I you know every year we'd come back for Thanksgiving. I've got a very very large family in Minneapolis, um, and uh, every time that I'd come out to Minneapolis, I would um, try to meet with other entrepreneurs uh, in in Minneapolis. And you know it's not it's a very very small ecosystem uh, here, and so. I um, ironically met with Mitch Cupid, who uh, uh, founded Code42, uh, which is a security um, and a backup company in Minneapolis. Um, and I met with him first, and he was kind of like actually showing me around. He was like, look, you know, these are the cool places where the startups are at. These are the accelerators, the incubators, et cetera. And he's like, oh, by the way, did you know that Target actually did an accelerator with Techstars uh, and they're housed out of this WeWork. Uh, why don't we go out there and like, let's, I'll intro you to a few people. Uh, so he, he had left Code42 and he was actually starting another startup. Um, and he introduced me to a TIFF uh, during Thanksgiving. We, you know, hung out a little bit. I got to know each other, really kind of hit it off right away. And, you know, I, I, went back to went, went back to San Francisco and you know a number of months went by um, and a tip you know would would message me every now and then and he kind of had these inklings that his business has some sort of payment uh, need um, and mm. by the way like let me let me rewind that um, so a branch when it was started started in, in LA it, uh, a TIFF moved it to Minneapolis to be part of the tech, Target Techstars Accelerator. Uh, Target was actually one of uh, Branch's first customers where um, we were actually supplying um, uh, scheduling software to the workers of Target. So uh, shift swapping, um, viewing your schedule, being able to take shifts at other Target locations, because all of this was actually being done on paper. Um, and we basically put it on a mobile app and, um, you know, it's really, really awesome business. Like I was super excited about it. Um, when a tip first told me about it and, um, you know, when he was, uh, when he closed the series a on the company, he basically reached out and he was like, Hey, I think there's something here about payments. Like, um, the, uh, the, the the main reason why we like the shift swapping and taking additional shifts is because these workers who typically are paycheck to paycheck um, are able to make more money because they're able to pick up more shifts because uh, historically, like you wouldn't know when a shift was available. And so therefore you wouldn't be able to take it. But now that it's on the app, uh, they were getting paid. But he's like, you know, there's something about when they get paid that's really interesting. And I'm looking for a head of product and would you be interested in joining? And so I was pretty excited about it. Um, you know, I, I had kind of finished uh, my fourth year at Marquetta and also my wife and I now were expecting our third kid. So remember, if we go back to the earlier part of the story, like we were originally planning on moving to Minneapolis, but then, um, you know, other things happened and we didn't. Uh, and my parents in the, in the middle were like, no, we're not moving to California. Um, and so we, uh, ended up, uh, you know, it's just like the timing was perfect. And so yeah. we were already looking for opportunities either in Connecticut where my wife is or in Minneapolis. And, um, this thing just kind of came in and a tip was like, you know, what's it going to take to bring you over? And I was like, uh, not a whole lot. Um, <laughs> so, so yeah, so I, I, yeah. I joined and, you know, within like, you know, a, a month essentially of me being there, uh, we pivoted the company to be a fintech, and what, How so? What, we... what is that? So you were providing scheduling software. Was yeah. that just not? Was that there not enough traction in that, or what was the why so, pivot? So the sales cycle um, for selling enterprise SaaS uh, products to large retailers is terrible. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, it's unfortunate. I mean, it was, it, you know, we, we were very fortunate to have a good in with um, some very large um, retailers, but 
still, it's a very, very long cycle. And, you know, people have to make a lot of very hard decisions to be able to put that in. But outside of that, um, even though we were able to help these workers make more money, um, they were still getting paid on the 15th and the 30th uh, or right. every two weeks, whatever the cycle is. Right. And um, the problem is that as soon as they would get their paycheck, they would spend it because they need to pay for bills and food and et cetera. And they'd be with the zero balance bank account uh, most of the time. So if an expense comes in in between uh, that time frame, they wouldn't have any money to go uh, get that. So they would go to payday lenders and then essentially get a, a, a payday loan, pay a lot of money for it so that they can just buy gas. And so hmm. what we said is, well, we already have a ton of data about these people. We know when they're working, we have their time and attendance. Like, why don't we try to figure out if we can advance them some money? Um, and so what we did is we went ahead and, you know, created a calculation. We uh, leveraged uh, data from Plaid and um, some other partners. And what we were able to do is we were able to send, you know, anywhere between 30 and $60 to these people so they can like buy gas to get to work or, um, buy groceries or whatever to like, uh, let them, let them get there. And this was even, I mean, the term earn wage access wasn't even around when we first launched this, but overnight that business just blew up. Um, and so, so you went and said, okay, let's first step is come up with an algorithm to say, what are the important inputs? And that would be maybe how long you've been working there, the consistency of how often you show up to your, your shifts, uh, what your hourly rate is something along those lines. And then you say, so you say, okay, this person has a 96% chance of paying back this loan. Uh, and, and you, you calculate, you know, how much you can give them. Um, I assume that's with some price to it, they're paying some, you know, interest rate on whatever they take out. Uh, so you factor that in as well. So you're constructing this, this model, right? And then you say, good, we got this written down on a napkin. Now, do you open up a bank account, throw money in it, and just write code to – how does that piece work? I mean, can you just – how do you go from like, okay, we got this this financial model to now we're extending money out? Yeah, so I mean the, fir the first piece is trying to figure out the financial model um, and get, gathering the data inputs. Um, we, you know, we did not want to charge any form of like interest because – Technically, it is their money, um, you know, mm -hmm. that, that we're borrowing from. Um, and so we came up with the process. That, yeah, I mean, we did need to charge initially because we had to pay um, for uh, push to card services, um, which is, you know, Visa Direct or MasterCard Send. There's a cost to being able to send that money. Um, and so we, we figured out a model and we charged for it and, you know, people loved it. Um, how do you uh, how do you technically do that? Is there a bank that will just allow you to, or you're using Stripe in the back end to just send money out based on your own uh, script that you have? Yeah, so so we um, use a combination of Phoenix and mm. Tabapay um, mm. to be able to do that, and these are acquirers um, uh, that basically have the capability of both accepting payments. Uh, you know, just being able to put in a card, just much like Stripe, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and you can also push payments as well. Uh, cool. and one, the, one of the major things was how do we leverage this for push payments, um, push to card, Visa Direct, MasterCard, Send, whatever you want to call it, right? Um, and what you do is you you grab the card number from the user in a secure way. There's a there's specific ways in which you do that. Um, and then uh, when they uh, push a button in the app for like, hey, I need $30, let's say we qualified them for $30, they push a button and that money gets sent like instantly uh, to their debit card. So if they've got a debit card with like Wells Fargo, for example, that $30, $30 shows up within seconds. And so I could mm -hmm. be at a situation where, you know, I swipe my card at the gas pump and my card gets declined because I don't have enough money. I push a button in the branch app and like swipe it again and it'll work. Like, Dope. Um, it's, it's, I, I would, I would say actually from magical technologies, I actually think that push to car technology is pretty awesome. Um, yeah. Why is it so late? You know, it's just like a reverse debit transaction. It, uh, it is, but I mean, it's, 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 it's kind of funny because like, 
it really was Uber um, that got this to become a little bit more mainstream. Um, but I mean, the, the product does exist for a long time. It's just that, you know, there weren't any like really great use cases. But then when Uber was like, yeah, we want to get these drivers paid out um, on a daily basis uh, and not have to rely on the ACH rails, I think that's really where it took off. Like in, they put it in, Lyft put it in, DoorDash, Instacart, et cetera, like all the gig economy companies were in. And then, you know, when you're trying to look for other use cases, we we were like, yeah, we want to be able to push like really small amounts of money to these people really fast who like really need it right now. They don't have time to wait for an ACH the next day. Like this dude needs to get to work. Like, and he's uh, stuck at a gas station and he doesn't have enough money. Like he needs the money like in within seconds, not within hours or even like next. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, next next business day, but after the federal holiday and no weekends, not after five <laughs> o'clock. <laughs> yeah, I mean, do you, do you, it, the whole banking system, the hours of it. I mean, I have nothing wrong with the speed, but the hours are just like the ACH transact. Why is ACH transaction so slow? Why does it take? three days, four days, only on during the weekdays. Can't they just press a button and say, (laughs) hey, we'll just do it after five. And I mean, the wire system ends at five. So, you know, I live on the West Coast. If you don't get it in by two, then it's not going to go out same day. I don't know, man. I hear all this stuff and I just think crypto has got to be, it's just, that's how you change it. You just build something better. Do you dive deep into, have you dove deep into crypto or how do you sort of, allocate your time on that i i am i definitely am digging in a lot more into crypto um it's it's definitely it's one of these things now where i have to like relearn it i feel like a complete noob you know um i don't you know i I think the cardano solana thing is super interesting um if uh i've been recently pretty obsessed with celsius uh, have mm. you ever used Celsius? Yeah, I, I use Celsius and Nexo is a very similar one too. Yeah, 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 exactly. So I'm, you know, I'm just kind of exploring how these apps work. And then, um, the other thing too, is the, the whole like high yield savings that you can do with USDC, um, mm-hmm. I think is super interesting. And I think there's a lot of applications there, uh, just because it's a stable coin. Um, mm-hmm. so yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of really interesting things going on with crypto and then. The other thing that's really cool is um, there are a lot of companies coming up that are figuring out the off ramps, the on ramps and the off ramps, right? Because it's as much as we make fun of ACH, like if you want to fund a wallet on Celsius, you need to use ACH. Or if you want to fund money onto uh, Coinbase, you have to use ACH. So like that's one way. Uh, Or wire. Isn't that the same thing? Yeah. Sure, sure. I, I mean... But regardless, it's using some sort of bank rail to get mm-hmm. the money at there. Now, um, the way that I transferred my money from Coinbase to Celsius is I just I used my Bitcoin and Ethereum address to to get there. Um, but, but I will say my first experience was very scary because I didn't know if it was going to happen, and all of a sudden, like money, uh, my my uh, Ethereum was like zero on my Coinbase. And then when I opened up my Celsius, it wasn't there. And I had a little <laughs> bit of a freak out moment. And then like 30 minutes later, it showed up. Yeah. Um, and so like, I still think there's a lot of work there because that is, it's too much anxiety, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's uh, so much power that's placed in the individual in you know, the ultra decentralized process is like, oh, you miss a character, oh, you lose your money. You know, it's like, gone, yeah, yeah. I mean, like easy to memorize things, you know. Yeah, no. There's a certain beauty in knowing that. Hey, if I send you money using an ACH, like I know it's going to be annoying, but it's not going to be lost. Uh, you know, you. But it's like you pay. You always pay a price. You pay a price for anything, whether you want to yeah. have the power. You know, you can have all your savings on a thumb drive, and or just you know stored in a wallet that you just keep in the cloud. There's always a price in regard, and it's kind of like, I think of it as just building a portfolio of risk. It's like, have some money in a bank, have some money in stocks, have some money in crypto. People yeah, are always different. Some people are like, I'm all in on crypto. Some people are like my dad, his generation, they're not going, he's just not interested in it. He's just like, I got my retirement account. I don't need to be thinking about this. I don't need to be learning about it. And it's, it's great. That's the, that's how 
you know, transaction. That's how uh, wealth flows from one generation to the next in some way, in our case. Absolutely. Is, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think any, everybody should be looking at it. It's, it's a very interesting space. It might not be for you, but you know, it, it is, it is going to be something that impacts our lives going, going forward. Hugely. For sure. Yeah. I mean, just the, 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 the number of use cases uh, of things that you can do in crypto that you can't do in a centralized way, uh, either because of regulation or because of the the structure of how money moves, uh, but just the just the creativity and saying, uh, you know, I want to have a loan, but it's like a loan with someone else I don't know, and I'm going to fractionalize it. The whole concept of fractionalizing ownership of something, you fractionalize the ownership of a house or, you know, NFTs are obviously very popular right now, but th they still just represent one sliver of what you can do with uh, ownership on chain. So, yeah, man, it is super interesting. But it's going to be a while before that changes completely. I mean, I think they'll – it almost seems like the U.S. government seems like they're working as fast as they can to make the U.S. dollar irrelevant uh, by just printing trillions of dollars yeah. and just giving it out to people, which is <laughs> certainly accelerating the crypto world. Uh, man. So uh, do you see yourself staying at Branch for a while? Do you see yourself getting into crypto more professionally? I, I mean, I think for me, um, you know, there is a long roadmap for us at Branch. And mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I think what, what we just talked about is, um, you know, simply how we kind of got going in fintech. But, you know, we, we essentially made earn wage access free um, by mm -hmm. shifting everybody to a digital wallet that, um we're able to offer to all these workers. It's a completely free checking account, um, you know, with a debit card, et cetera. Uh, totally modern. I, uh, you know, again, I actually am a customer of something that I got a chance to have a hand in building. So we, uh, we use Marketa for a lot of our uh, processing cool. on, on the, on the card side. And so that's been kind of an awesome experience. There is the little bit of continuation, I guess, from mm -hmm. that story. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, there's a ton of really, really, you know, great things that we can build. And there's a lot of just problems with, you know, the, you know, some of the, the challenges that a lot of these uh, working Americans have. And yeah. uh, I, I want to try to figure out how we can best service them. And I mean, I think there is some, there is a play for crypto. Absolutely. Like, you know, being able to even educate uh, these folks on what is crypto and like why it makes sense to like do a little bit of investing there or whatever. Um, uh, certainly there is a yeah. lot of room there, but generally speaking, we, we just want to help these people get paid really, really fast. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Even have the option of getting paid out in crypto. Actually, a company I was working on for the last three years, we just sold it, but we were building the on-ramp and off-ramp for crypto using gift cards. So people could buy nice. a gift card and then trade that for uh, for crypto, Bitcoin in particular. And then once you're in the crypto game, you could trade it for anything else you want. But it's like, yeah, I'm with you. The on-ramp off ramp is uh, it's a big deal. You know, the more of them that there are, the more stable I think crypto becomes because it's like people still view it as the government's one power that they have. The biggest one I view is like they can just say, hey, uh, banks. No, no more of this. You know, you were, we're cutting you off and they could certainly, they could do that tomorrow. But if there's the more on ramps, the more off ramps, more people using it for real, practical, useful methods of trade, the better. And yeah. So kudos to you, man. Thanks for hopping on today, Ahmed. Uh, congrats on all the progress. Check out anatomy of the swipe making money move. Are you active on social media anywhere? Yeah, I'm active on Twitter. It's just uh, at Siddiqui Ahmed. Um, if you want to, you can also reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, you can just search for me, Ahmed Siddiqui, um, at Branch. I'm sure you'll be able to find me pretty easy. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you. And um, I hope that your listeners will um, find this info valuable. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for writing the book, man. I'm, I'm excited to check it out and congrats on all your progress. Thanks again. Awesome.